number 10, the chimpanzee human. Also referred to as human Zs, which is fun to say. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees, DNA-wise. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with these hairy fellows. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A human Z was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Avanov inseminated female chimps with human DNA, but it didn't work. Or did it? Things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene in the 70s. Yeah, he was walking like a human, which we've never really seen before. He was referred to as the missing link because of his appearance and the way you would act. He was previously a performance animal. He was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day, which is, yeah, I agree. Also, I remember seeing chimps in family movies, I'm pretty sure. Remember those movies growing up where chimpanzees were like snowboarding or playing hockey? Most extreme primate, that was it. That's where we're at, chimpanzees doing barrel rolls and hockey stops. My friends, we're already there. I think we're already at the Planet of the Apes terrifying point. We're screwed if one of these experiments works, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles talking about chimps. Time to get into the real scary science. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research, obviously. The whole idea was to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. I like these projects because we're moving forward, at least. We're not just doing it because we're like, eh, let's see if we can bring dinosaurs back. We're trying to find a solution. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows. Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class, okay? There's other ways to wake up in the morning. Let's just leave cows alone for like a bit, maybe? Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with the human and skin cells. And then in a little time, the egg can develop and turn into a blastocyst, aka a cloned embryo. And there we have stem cells for said science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go here with DNA mixing? How much DNA are we going to mix before we're like, stop? Things could go south. For example, just like the number eight. Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a time even before horses arrived, so they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons, and smaller ones would help pulling plows and smaller loads. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol back then. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Nice, yummy. Oh, I wonder what this one is. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a kunga. It's gotta be a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, it's crazy what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from thousands of years ago. Science is incredible. It's more amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. And it seems like we could use them. Number seven, woolly mammoth. It was announced less than a year ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a new biosciences and genetics company called Colossal, they got the funding finally for quite this project. They're planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. Yep. Instead of just paying off student loans, they're like, how about we bring a mammoth back? Let's just see if we can do that. That'll solve some problems. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago. But what if we had these hairy goliaths back again today? The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these guys, but climate change began to slow them down. Also, humans needing food definitely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and... Well, obviously, look at them. Lots of food. So they died off quite quick. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. And they're on the way. They're, they're doing it right now. That's happening as we speak. A mammoth is being born. They're using the CRISPR gene editing tool, which is a fun tool, I guess. Elephants are still kicking around and their genomes combined with the preserved mammoth DNA is the magic trick. So if you see mammoths trending on Twitter in four to six years, well, you know why. There's not another Ice Age movie. It's definitely just a real mammoth. Number six, Pyrenean ibex. The Pyrenean ibex also went extinct a long time ago. This was much sooner though than mammoths. This was around 2000. The last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly ended her life. Of all the ways to go, really? Come on, man, that's sad. It was a subspecies of the Spanish ibex. They were native to the Pyrenees mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level because of, you know, knights and swords and bows equals lunch, right? So the numbers dipped more than fair, this army's to feed, but in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean ibex to return. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven whole minutes. Yeah, seven minutes in heaven, or seven minutes out of heaven, rather. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Yeah, a little goat, a little goat hybrid. Lung complications are why the clone sadly didn't last, but we had a hybrid medieval animal for seven minutes. We're getting close. Number five, the super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Introducing the super cow. Okay, start your day off with some super milk, and then have a super stomach ache. <laughs> 
at your super pants. My god, I can't do milk anymore. Only in Belgium. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmers brought together native cattle and short horn cattles to make this hybrid animal. After that, they would literally just pick the biggest cows of the bunch and then have them breed together, and then so on and so forth. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. I can't even look at them. God, they're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. Just, it makes no sense. How does, what? Where does that come from? Let's move on. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s, also quite recently. Major factors here are as, you know, you guessed what I said earlier, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. All those combined, it's just no chance. It's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's also recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back to life. Hey, what's up? Hey, you've been asleep, hi. Hybrid science. There we go. Let's get mixing. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? I think we're ready. Let's jazz up some trails by introducing these guys. Specimens of the Tasmanian tiger still remain preserved in jars. No idea who has them or why, but we'll move on from that. Thank God for those jars. So we have Tasmanian tiger genes present, so scientists can now insert them into a mouse fetus. They just combine fetus of a mouse in DNA. I, I do this a lot, this is how I explain, I'm gonna explain this to my kids and be like, hey, this is how, how, how the human life cycle works. You just do this with your hands a lot and then you're alive. They're still lacking the full DNA to successfully recreate it, but they're close. A recent $5 million donation to the University of Melbourne earlier this year allowed for researchers to create a research lab. So yep, they're actually getting very close. They're like making the lab to make this thing. I'm like, ooh, they're gonna do it. Number three, the Great Razor Auk. Ah uh, yes, once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were cute, but quite defenseless, these little guys. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and or eating, and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were hanging out, so they disappeared fast. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Eldie Island, just off the coast of Iceland. And that was it. They were gone. Until now. Nice. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs. Remember those guys in jars and the organs that I talked about? Yep. Classic organs in jars. Always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed ox. So now we get a Nice fun hybrid again. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, so keep it up. Keep bringing things back from extinction. Just not humans, I don't want zombies, please. Number two, lions. Back in the 80s in the Chatbir Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together domestic lions and African lions in the hopes that they would just be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a step forward, we love those. But the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and was like, you know what? We're gonna save you guys, get out of the circus. Then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions, so. I mean, from circus to science, it's like, eh, you're still sorry. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake from the get-go. The cubs already had severely weak back legs, they were having trouble walking as they got older, their immune system started to fail, and by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. So they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. There are luckily laws that prohibited them from killing these animals, so at this point, we're just waiting for them to die naturally, which sucks, but it's definitely better. And finally, number one, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the islands of Maridius located in the Indian Ocean. They were awesome. We've seen them in ice ages. They're all funny and big and furry. They had massive talons. They were gray and blue. They were gorgeous. And best part of all, they didn't have any natural predator until, you know, us, we, until we came around. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and well, the rest is history, and or lunch. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, they were not 100% to blame here. Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal basically that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch, so it didn't take long for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but could it be? Could we bring back said dodo birds? Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart there and bringing them back to life via hybrid science. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring the bird back. I mean, yeah, I'm all for the idea of bringing an animal back to life. Scientifically, that's definitely a feat in itself, but how long before these things are on hot ones, you know? Like dodo chicken wings? Now that I've said it, you kind of want one, right? Now you feel bad. 
There we go, hit that thumbs up so we don't feel guilty. Starting off this countdown, we have the human monkey hybrid. Guys, I wish this was fake, but it's not. So scientists are currently trying to make human monkey hybrids. They have high hopes that these experiments will succeed because monkeys and humans are similar genetically. Spanish biologist Juan Carlos Belmonte is working with monkey researchers in China to perform these experiments. So basically, they are mixing human cells into monkey embryos. Their objective is to grow a monkey whose organs are completely made out of human cells. They then would use these animals and their organs for people that need the organs. Of course, this is controversial in a number of ways, as you can imagine. In our number nine spot today, we have bees. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. A lot of us know bees as pretty harmless and kind of cute little pollinators, unless of course you're allergic or terrified, but truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went awry and caused a new crossbred bee. This experiment was to take a regular honeybee and breed it with a bee that was found in Africa that produces a lot more honey, and of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honeybee would. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment and the 80s saw the beginning of the trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them so they can sting multiple times. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times as many stings as regular swarms, they react to disturbances 10 times faster, and they will also chase the disturbance a quarter of a mile. These bees have actually caused at least 1,000 deaths, so it's safe to say that this is one experiment gone horribly wrong. Moving on, at number eight, we have the pig human hybrid. Again, you heard me correctly. Scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences in California have created a human pig hybrid. So in 2017, an embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. Then it was taken out and analyzed and the embryo survived and contained some human cells. So their hope is to grow human organs inside of pigs instead of waiting for a donor. Similar to the tests that are being done on the monkeys as I previously mentioned mention. No animals are safe at this point. In our number seven spot today, we have the wolfin. I wish I never had to say the word wolfin, but unfortunately they do exist. These guys are created when a female common bottlenose dolphin is bred with a male false killer whale. They're extremely rare and have been found in the wild, but unfortunately most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. The first recorded wolfin was born at the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Probably a prime example of why they really maybe shouldn't even exist in the first place. The first that was born in the United States that actually miraculously survived was at a sea life park in Hawaii in May of 1985. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days. The second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still living. In March of last year, both her and her daughter are still alive, but they still remain in captivity. Coming in at number six, we have Ilya Ivanich Ivanov. What a name. But this is the name of the dude that originally tried to create a human chimp hybrid. Ilya was a Russian biologist who did a number of disturbing experiments in the 1920s. He started with crossbreeding animals. So he managed to produce a zebra donkey hybrid, a Z-donk, and a bison cow cross, which is a Zubron, and also crossed rats, mice, guinea pigs, and rabbits together with each other. But he decided to take it further with the human and monkey crossing. In fact, he successfully managed to inseminate three female chimpanzees with human sperm. His experiments were so famous that five women actually offered to carry half-ape babies inside of them in the name of science, which thankfully didn't go through. Or if it did, he did it in private with no one else knowing. In our number five spot today, we have farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money for them and their families. This should be amazing and great, right? Well, considering why we're all here today, I think we all know the answer to that question. 
question. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great things, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, but also needed way more higher quality food or else they'd stop producing more milk. And they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it's this kind of situation like, yes, they are producing more milk, which will get us some more money, but they also cost us more. And truthfully, most of the times the increased milk production did not outweigh the growing costs. In our fourth spot, we have Hiromitsu Nakuchi. Hiromitsu is a stem cell biologist from Tokyo. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government. And let me tell you what he's planning on doing. Basically, he hopes to grow human cells in mice and rats, and then transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. So again, another experiment having to do with growing human cells in animals. So his experiment started by injecting some cells into rat and mice embryos. But those rodents have been genetically manipulated so they can't make a pancreas for themselves. But his hope is that the rodents' bodies will use the human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. Here's the thing. While conducting the experiments, if they find that the rats are starting to develop a human-type brain, then they have to stop the experiments on them. It's part of the agreement that he has with the government. They don't want a humanized animal coming into existence. In our number three spot today, we have the beefalo. Okay, so beefalo sounds kind of cute and silly, and it also looks pretty normal, so what could be wrong with this one? Well, let's start at the beginning. So, a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones started breeding them in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was so exceptionally low. So, bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state, and the number numbers remain relatively low because of the limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and there aren't any natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's wild! So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that is really the trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they can obviously clear up a water source pretty quickly. Not to mention the fact that they do their business in the water and how their heavy weight compacts the soil. Well, basically, they have thrown the ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and the insects and plant life around have also been affected. In our second spot, we have the breeding gone wrong. If you're a dog lover like Olivia and I, then this story is going to make you upset. In 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said she didn't want to keep her. When Julie saw the dog, she was in complete disbelief. The dog had a squished body, huge jaw, a bad underbite, and was oddly shaped. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from a backyard breeder who was carelessly breeding a bunch of his dogs together. Thankfully, Julie took the dog in and gave her a loving home. But it's sad to see dogs born like this just from reckless people who only have money on their mind. In our number one spot today, we have lions. In the 1980s, the Chapier Zoo in India started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has a less shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake as the cubs had severely weak back legs. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune systems started to fail. By 2000, when they had already bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions, they finally decided to stop the program and all of the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction. There are laws that prohibit them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting for them to die naturally. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. In our number 10 spot, we have Vladimir Demikov. Vladimir is a scientist from the Soviet Union that tried to create a two-headed dog. Not making this up. Not in the regular crossbreeding way that you may assume. He literally amputated the body of one of the dogs and attached it to the other. This honestly makes me sick to talk about. The dogs only lasted four days before passing away. And guess what? He did it again. He did it again. 
The next experiment ended up with two dogs living for about a month. But guess what? He literally had no purpose for these experiments. Just the ego satisfaction of being able to say that he did it. Well, thankfully he didn't because he doesn't deserve any satisfaction or praise. Just gross. In our number nine spot, we have Paracelsus. Paracelsus is known for being a Swiss physician, scientist, and alchemist in the 1500s during the Renaissance. He didn't necessarily experiment with crossbreeding humans with animals, but he did experiment with making humans tiny and ginormous. Also, he was seemingly evil slash insane, so I just wanted to put him on this list. Paracelsus was convinced he could grow giants and tiny humans by growing them from a jar of Yep. Apparently he would keep the jar in a warm place and feed the creatures blood to make them grow. I can just see him sprinkling in some blood into that jar. <laughs> Apparently he was quite successful and managed to grow tiny humans, but allegedly the small creatures turned on him and ran away. <laughs> Naturally. They were said to be a foot high. In our number eight spot, we have Irving Wiseman. Irving Wiseman was working at Stanford University as a researcher when he was given permission to inject a mouse with human brain cells. They just wanted to see what would happen. They were instructed to stop the experiment once the human-like behaviors got to a specific point like improved memory or problem solving, because then they'll have a pinky in the brain sitch and the concept of that only sounds good in the cartoon world. I'm not ready for a mouse world takeover anytime soon. In our number seven spot, we have Gordon Gallup and his team of scientists. Okay, so not saying Gordon Gallup is the evil scientist, but more that all of the scientists that consented to do this in the first place may have been operating from an evil frequency. Or perhaps they were just doing what they were told because it's their job. Because let's be real, the real powerful people that make the decisions are the ones funding such projects as these. But since I have no idea who funded this, as that would probably take too much digging that I don't have time for and it will probably just lead us to the US government, <laughs> we're going to just call this spot Gordon Gallup and his team of scientists. Gordon Gallup was once one of the leading experts in evolutionary psychology and he worked with a team of scientists in the 1920s on interbreeding humans with chimpanzees. He leaked to the press that they were actually successful. The experiment was conducted at the Orange Park Laboratory in Florida. Everyone proceeds to Google the financial backers there. This is where a female chimpanzee was inseminated with human the animal not only became pregnant, but then proceeded to give birth to a living being, a human Z. But get this, they did not allow the human Z to live. After all of that, it was euthanized. What the heck, man? Potentially harmed this animal by impregnating it only to kill its baby cub. <sighs> My inner future mama bear is poking through and I don't like this. In our number six spot, we have another group of scientists, the Belgian scientists. It really is so hard to name just one scientist responsible because it really does take a village to raise a child, and in this case, to create a mutant cow. Yes, a team of Belgian scientists started back in the 1800s to breed native cattle with short horn cattle, and over time, they only selected the biggest and strongest, and eventually, that led them to creating the Belgian super cow. A ginormous cow that literally looks like it's on steroids, and I'm kinda afraid of it. I'm, I'm very afraid of it. It is unclear why these experiments were being done. I can only assume for more meat. So I guess we can't call these scientists evil per se without a justified reason, but hopefully they have a good one because otherwise, leave those cows alone. In our number five spot, we have Juan Carlos Belmonte. Juan is a biologist at the Salk Institute in California that has been working with other scientists and researchers in China on creating a human animal chimera. Basically, a monkey embryo will be given human cells to create this. Now, before you get upset and say, what for? I think this may arguably be the best reason for doing this kind of experiment. The reason this is being done is to see if animals can possess organs such as livers and kidneys that are entirely human and can be used in the future as organs for transplants. As we do have a transplant shortage around the world, coming up with a solution to this is vital. 
Apparently, every 10 minutes, a new person is added to the waiting list for an organ transplant. So at this point, it is unclear as to whether the experiment has been completely successful, but I'm sure we'll know in the upcoming years. In our number four spot, we have Dr. Carl Clauberg. This guy is truly very evil. He was a doctor that would work in the infamous monstrous camps that I cannot name due to YouTube violation reasons, so please catch my drift. The monstrous camps during World War II, specifically the Poland camp. Apparently, originally, he was interested in sterilizing all of the women of the camp, and eventually, his interests expanded. He was allowed to experiment on thousands, but only 700 survived. He also artificially inseminated prisoners through a variety of methods and tormented his victims by claiming to have injected animal into their womb to create a monster. There are no reports that confirm this to be 100% true, as well as there are no reports of the after effects of this, so we have to conclude that this horrible, uh, unconsented experiment was thankfully a failure. Just pure evil. In our number three spot, we have Hiromitsu Nagauchi. Hiromitsu is a scientist from Japan that is leading a team at the University of Tokyo. He and his team plans to grow human cells in mice and rat embryos and then transport them into surrogate animals, similar to work being done at Stanford University in the US. The goal is yet again to continue to see if animals can produce human organs that can later be transplants for humans. Up until recently, Japan Japan was very strict as to how long the human cells in the embryos were allowed to be kept alive till. But recently the laws changed and they're allowed to be kept until the animal is brought to term. Whoa. This will help so much in terms of what they will be able to find through studying this process. But of course there are many ethical concerns around this experiment such as once this new animal is brought to term, then won't it be a baby? Some claim that this is pure evil to then destroy this baby after, but gosh, I wonder if the decision maker of these experiments struggle with this, cause I definitely would. In our number two spot, we have an unknown evil scientist that created the human sheep. In 2017, villagers of a small town in South Africa were frightened when a local sheep gave birth to a human sheep crossbreed. This is truly terrifying stuff that will haunt your dreams. Like terrifying. It will definitely haunt mine. Imagine human sheep wandering the world. No thanks. Clearly this experiment was done by some evil scientist that decided, heck, I'm going to just let this happen and see how it unfolds. No one knows exactly how it was done, but most think the sheep was just artificially inseminated. The baby born was a stillborn, but if it had made it out alive, I bet you the world would have been on the hunt for the person responsible. In our number one spot, we have Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov. Known from his title, The Red Frankenstein, who was said to have been the creator of artificial insemination. His interest eventually turned into being interested in crossbreeding. In the 1920s, he traveled to Africa after already successfully crossbreeding a zebra and a donkey, he now wanted to crossbreed a human and an ape. Apparently, after a while of living in Africa, he became desperate as his funds became increasingly low that he then began to inseminate African women with chimpanzees without their knowledge. Holy, that's disgusting. Eventually, when people found out about what he was doing, he was shut down and his name was forever tarnished and yeah, I'm glad because that's horrible. Starting off our list at number 10, new bees. Great, sick of the old ones that sting you in the neck and then you're allergic? We got some new bees now to worry about, here we go. A lot of us know bees are pretty harmless and kind of cute, hairy little pollinators. Unless of course, like I mentioned, you're allergic or terrified of them. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm, obviously, right? Save the bees. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went south. Yeah, this experiment resulted in a new Bee, just a dangerous bee. The idea was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces more honey. And of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Good stuff, right? On paper this sounds like a step in the right direction. Well the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. Yeah, liars. You're fired, all 1,000 of you. Get out of here. 
After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and in the 80s, we saw the beginning of a massive trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kind of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards human beings. Nice. And when these guys sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can, you know, continue to Julius Caesar you how many times they want. The victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms, so... Horrible, horrible news. And they react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile. So, hope you can run really fast and really far. Number nine, Wolfen. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male false killer whale. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. They're extremely rare and they have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity because humans are the worst. The first recorded Walfin was born in the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Didn't even make it one year, horrible. Probably a prime example of why they maybe shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't know, just a wild observation. The first that was born in the United States that actually somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in May 1985, and her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still alive. In March last year, both Kekamalu and her daughter were still alive, but they remain, of course, in captivity. So it's like, great, but not, really not at the same time. Number eight. Farm cattle. Back in the 90s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which in turn would mean more money for them and their families. Awesome, this should be amazing and great news, right? Well, considering why we're here watching, I don't think it's, uh, it's gonna end the way we think, no. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great results, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, great, but they also needed way more food. They needed high quality food as well, or else they'd stop producing more milk and they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it cost them more money, know what I mean? Yeah, we got more milk, but we have to spend more money on maintaining the damn thing. That's not a win. It's not a win in my book. Number seven, old Buffalo Jones. Here we go. A guy named Charles Buffalo Jones. Let's talk about him. This man started breeding animals in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. Nice. Old Buffalo Jones getting his science on. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state. And the numbers remained relatively low because of limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo, good name, found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and therefore aren't any you know, natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's a lot of beefalo. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that has the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and they can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they're sucking it all up, you know what I mean? It's like when you're in school and you're waiting for water and the guy in front of you just keeps drinking. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Where is this going? Not to mention the fact that they do their dirty business in the water and that basically just ruins it all. Basically, they've thrown the entire ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and insects and plant life around have also been infected, all because they're thirsty and they like to take big shits where we all drink our water. Thanks, Beefalo. Number six, hybrid lion. Back in the 1980s, the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller, has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Again, sounds like a great plan at first. How do we make it happen without making weird animals? The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their other two Asiatic lions. Nice. Hey, we'll save ya. Just kidding, even worse. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were all shaky. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune system started to fail more and more. Sadly, by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction further. There's also laws that prohibited them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting around for them to die naturally. It's kind of a weird circle we got. It too. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they just wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. Know what I mean? It was right there and they're like, all right, now let's try something new. It's like, what? No, why? Number five, Kunga. 
Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing, here we go, halfway through, time to turn it up a bit, scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now this was a time before even horses arrived, so they had to do something, right? Large kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pulling plows. These little guys, they were the talk of the town. Imagine hybrid animals before horses, no wonder they were a status symbol. 4,000 years ago they were given as gifts for weddings. Yeah, yeah, yummy. I wonder what this one is. It smells a little stinky. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. And yeah, it's a wild ass over there. Hey, nice wild ass. It's wild what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from even thousands of years ago. It's mind blowing. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Number four, super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Just tons of a moo, just a mighty moo. Introducing the super cow. All right, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache and shit your super pants. Only in Belgium, let's do it. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmer brought together native cattle and shorthorn cattle. After that, they would literally pick the biggest of the bunch and then have them breed together. These cows are officially called Belgian blues but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. I can't even look at these guys. They're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. That makes no sense. They have like eight biceps. The Incredible Hulk, just with more milk. Number three, the mouse with an ear on its back. Oh, I want to Q-tip this guy every time I see him. The mouse with a human ear, folks. How did this happen? This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. Stuart Little's evil brother. Let's do it. Back in 1997, this vacanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And clearly it worked a little too well. It's a little odd what we have. We're still talking about it, obviously. It's weird. It all started when Joseph Vicanti, a pediatric surgeon, began designing human organs. This was during a shortage in time. He wasn't just bored and started to make ears. He was changing the medical game. And little did he know, he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. Kind of hard to bring up, but we'll do our best. Okay. Chuck failed. He spilled the beans almost right away. But now we know that cow cartilage can create human cells. That's great. Oh, I want to Q-tip his back. Is that weird? That's not weird. Gives ear cheese a whole new meaning. We're going to throw out. Number two, the Zorfs. I'll give you a second to figure out what animal this is. Nice, there you go. Male zebra, female horse. Now we've got a really fun word. Zebroids are also quite common historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses and donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. It's pretty cute. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey. All these fun names, right? But again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. These zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip and bizarre? Are. Oh, I know. Humans are not great. Humans are too bored, it seems. And finally, number one, Hiramitsu Nakauchi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This last one is too wild. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here. Not old Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, we're getting to modern science now. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside mice and rats, right? Like we just talked about. But then he wants to transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic going in and out. Cells into rats and mice embryos. How do we even get here? We went from Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for you. What? But his hope here was that the rodents' bodies will be used for human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. So it's kind of like a kickoff into biology, right? Here's the thing, while conducting said experiments, they found out that rats were starting to develop a human type brain. Yeah, that's when they decided to pull the plug, rightfully so. The second humans and animals get too close, governments come in and they go, hey, stop. Thanks. Number 10, monkey head transplant. Okay, right off the top, here we go, pun intended. The first ever successful monkey head transplant was back in the early 1970s. I imagine some of your parents may have heard about this. It's probably pretty hard to forget. Maybe ask them about it tonight while they're mid-bite at dinner. American researcher Robert White pulled off the otherwise impossible in a slow, tedious operation. White took the head of one monkey and then attached it to a headless monkey. Yeah, add a little time and energy and voila, this act 
actually worked. Yeah, believe it or not, the monkey actually tried to bite one of the surgeons once it came to, which, I mean, totally fair. I'd be a little pissed off too if I just had a different body all of a sudden. Sadly, the monkey passed away nine days later, which is much further than I ever thought. But the fact that this actually happened is one, terrifying, and two, dare I say, miraculous. This is some sci-fi stuff right here. And here you go, new head, enjoy. Number nine, monkey become human. Okay, this next test here is a little less hands-on. So if you have some food, you could probably take a bite during this one. It's safe. Back in 1931, psychologist Winthrop Kellogg, familiar name, he was curious. Yeah, he sat up one night out of the blue and thought, hmm, what would happen if a monkey was raised with humans? Yeah, would it end up like that monkey from MVP, Most Valuable Primate? Would it learn to play hockey for the local team? Or would it learn how to do kickflips with Tony Hawk? No, none of that shit happened. Surprise, surprise. Kellogg brought a baby female chimp named Gua into his home, and this man raised a chimp as if it were another human being alongside his own son, human son, Donald. Yeah, they played, they laughed, they did everything together, but the test ended abruptly after Kellogg's son, Donald, started to make chimp noises. Yeah, and then everyone was like, you know what? I'm good, let's cancel this. Maybe chimps can't learn how to heel flip. We're done, let's go home. So Gua was then, Released, there we go. No more human best friend, you know? Back to normal, dare I say, normal? Number eight, feel the music. Okay, this next one here is a little fun and we're on a part three and I have to talk about it. I just have to talk about it. There are many odd experiments in history where humans should have left, you know, human elements out, like music and illicit substances. I can't say what I wanna say, but it's white, it's fluffy. It's a bad substance that's white and fluffy. There you go, that's all I'll say. YouTube's like, oh, what is he saying? I can't figure it out. There you go, only, only you and I know. We're too smart for the algorithm. Well, back in 2011, a study was done where rats, just a bunch of rats, were all put in a room and on loop, they played a Miles Davis song. So they were all on said illicit substance, right? that stuff, and they were in a room while Miles Davis played all, all day long. Just smooth jazz all day. I'm not laughing because like it's funny, I'm just, it's the weirdest thing. Imagine walking into this room by accident, you're like, what's going on in here? Oh my God, everyone's all hopped up. Well, before the substances were injected into the test subjects, they all seemed to have calm demeanors while Beethoven played on loop. But after injected, all the rats were neurologically triggered to that smooth, smooth jazz. Yeah, after one week on the sauce, the rats were all of a sudden like, you know what, Miles Davis. Kind of slaps. Been sleeping on Miles Davis this whole time. They're all like, yeah, Miles Davis, really good, so good. Horrible animal research and taxpayers' money. Yeah, we love dark history here on Most Amazing Top 10. Number seven, the first pregnancy test. If you're looking past the ancient Egyptian times and their use of barley and urine to determine if somebody is pregnant, you'll often land on this experiment from the 1930s. Now, it was developed in 1931 by Dr. Maurice Friedman at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, what would happen is doctors would inject they would inject a rabbit with urine from a woman who was suspected of being pregnant. And the rabbit's ovaries could easily tell if that was the case. Accurate test? Yeah. Historical? Of course, it changed the game. Would it also end up with the rabbits passing away? Sadly, also a third yes. It's sad, but more often than not, when humans are involved with any medical process, the test subject dies. You know, before having its head transferred to another animal or something, you're like, what the f is happening here? Number six, small brain and big brain. This next one here, I mean, again, we're on a part three. We're getting into some f***ed up stuff, here we go. In the early 19th century, humans were figuring out a lot of uh, firsts, you know, especially German researcher, Carl August Weinhold. He was on the quest to prove to all that the brain and its nervous system were both attached by wires. Yeah, in order to do so, he took brains and spinal cords of deceased cats and he filled the cavities inside with zinc and silver batteries. And like we know now, the obvious happened. The bodies began to reanimate as if they were alive again. Huh. It's like it's black magic or batteries, probably batteries. It's definitely the batteries. This was the first time this type of test was done and now we use electricity and silver for other ways, of course. But thanks to this curious doctor, the early 19th century saw some early Bill Nye the Gross Science Guy stuff. Again, wh imagine walking into this room by accident. It's like, oh, oh, what's going on in here now? Number five, the multi-dog. Ah, nice, I love dogs. Let's get a bunch for the price of none. Back in the 50s, when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a multi-dog, Time Magazine had to cover it. 
it. Of course, this is a feat in science. As cruel as it sounds, of course, the adult dog had a newborn grafted to its neck. It's impressive, but also you're like, ew, my God, Jesus. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term, gross. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics, which was the craziest point here. Some say it was playful with its growls, just as the other dog's characteristics would be. It's a sad 1950s Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive for a long time. It just, you know, all of a sudden it was on something's neck and then it was in the next life. That's horrible. Number four, the great razor auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the great auk would grow to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were little cute tiny boys. They were cute but quite defenseless, obviously since they're not here anymore. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were all living. Yeah, Newfoundland, go get screeched in and then take out a thousand ox. There we go. It was packed, so they rapidly declined. And by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island. What a But now, scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs, you know, people how they have, you know, birds in jars and stuff like that. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor build auk. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore may bring these birds back to life, so. Cute flappy wings may just return. Remember that game Flappy Wings? Disappeared from the app store so quick. Disappeared faster than number three, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled islands all over the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were gray and blue. They didn't have any natural predator until, you know, we came along. Sorry, we got hungry. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. That's where it comes from. They weren't just loved by sailors either. No, monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. And reminder, they were big eggs. So it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681. Again, imagine being that guy, what a dick. But could it be? Could we bring the dodo back to life with science? Yes, apparently, this could be a real thing. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes and we're gonna see them in the sky. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back, you know, animals and stuff. Scientifically, that's a wonderful feat, but do we really think no one's gonna make dodo bird chicken wings? I'm gonna get that on Uber Eats in a year. I can just smell it. Number two, the gastric brooding frog. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Nice, we're getting close to the end, it seems. I'm a big fan of frogs and the gastric brooding frog is particularly interesting to me and also scientists due to their birthing process. If you're eating something, now would be a good time to you know, hit that thumbs up, maybe take a break, put that food to the side for a bit. See, these frogs back, you know, and when they were alive, they would swallow their eggs and then they would hatch them later out of their mouths. Pretty, pretty horrible if you watch that in time lapse, I bet. They're fascinating creatures. And with the Lazarus Project, scientists are actually trying to bring back the Australian gastric brooding frog from extinction. So we might see this horrible act in person. You might go to catch a frog and then all of a sudden it'll be like, Wah! and there's a baby will come out of it and you'll be like, all right, I'm all set actually, how about that? They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys back out of extinction, it would be one point for Gryffindor. We'd be looking a lot better, that's all I'm saying. And finally, number one, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to end with my girl Martha. The passenger pigeon once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was the 19th century, and it looked a lot different. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block the sun out for a short amount of time. Wow. Hashtag flocks that block. We love it. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeon, just, just, they're, they're gone. Just like that. They're no more. So what exactly happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She sadly passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her past and their extinction. And we found a couple. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated the nicest looking pigeon, arguably. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now they blended passenger pigeon DNA with dinosaur DNA, so that's always exciting. We've seen a few movies on how that can go wrong. We're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, I'm glad science is allowing us to, you know, try again have another go. But look at the pigeons we have now. Those pigeons are hardcore. These things will walk onto the subway with you. Pigeons today will ask you for change. They're ruthless. They're covered in mustard. It's not the same. These graceful birds from the 
1910s. I feel like we're bringing back Captain America, you know what I mean? I don't think these old school chaps will appreciate the new game of pigeons. They're a little dirty, I don't know. I don't think they're ready, and I don't think we are either. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have bees. A lot of us know bees is pretty harmless and are kind of cute little pollinators, unless of course you're allergic or terrified. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was, of course, until an experiment in the 1970s went awry and caused a new crossbred bee. This experiment was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces a lot more honey. And of course, the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment and the 80s saw the beginning of the trouble. The bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they are also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can sting multiple times. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times as many stings as regular swarms. They react to disturbances 10 times faster, and they will also chase the disturbance a quarter of a mile. Imagine. These bees have actually caused at least a thousand deaths, so it's safe to say that this is one experiment gone horribly wrong. In our number nine spot today, we have lions. In the 1980s at the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has less of a shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were having extreme trouble walking, and as they got older, their immune systems started to fail. By 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions, and they finally decided to stop the program, and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction. There are laws that prohibit them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting for them to die naturally. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they did have. In our number eight spot today, we have the human Z. One of the most contentious and ethically charged endeavors pursued by Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, an extremely controversial Russian biologist, was his endeavor to produce a hybrid offspring between humans and apes. The goal actually was to create a superhuman soldier for military purposes. And as early as 1910, Ivanov presented his concept of achieving such a feat through the means of artificial insemination during the World Congress of Zoologists in Graz, Austria. In the 1920s, Ivanov embarked on a series of experiments aimed at creating a human-ape hybrid in French Guinea. Three female chimpanzees were selected as potential surrogate mothers, and the experiment began. However, despite his efforts, Ivanov was unable to achieve a successful pregnancy and bring about the desired hybrid offspring. Thank God. Upon his return to the Soviet Union in 1929, Ivanov sought to organize a new set of experiments involving the use of non-human ape seminal fluid and human volunteers. What human would volunteer for that? I don't know, and I don't want to know. However, these plans were met with setbacks, notably the demise of his last remaining orangutan, which which delayed the commencement of the proposed endeavors. Ivanov's pursuit of creating a human ape hybrid was met with considerable controversy and skepticism. Fair enough. The scientific community was divided, with many dismissing his ideas as unfeasible and scientifically dubious. Nevertheless, his experiments reflect a dark chapter in the history of crossbreeding experiments, highlighting the extreme lengths some scientists were willing to go to in the pursuit of scientific knowledge, even if it meant transgressing the boundaries of ethical conduct. In our number seven spot today, we have the Zonki. Another one of the strange and unsettling experiments from Ivanov involved the creation of hybrid offspring known as Zonkis, or zebrases, by crossing female zebras with donkeys. This experiment aimed to explore the possibilities of interbreeding between closely related species and were conducted during the early 20th century. The goal was to create a hybrid offspring that would exhibit a mix of characteristics from both zebra and donkey parents. These experiments were actually somewhat 
successful, leading to the birth of several zonkeys. The resulting zonkeys possessed traits from both species, with physical characteristics resembling a combination of zebras and donkeys. They often displayed striped markings on their bodies, similar to those found on zebras of course, and zonkeys typically retained the zebra's body shape as well, while inheriting certain donkey features such as a long ear and tuft tails. It's very cute. While these experiments achieved some success in producing hybrid offspring, they did face ethical concerns and criticism due to the manipulation of animal genetics for experimental purposes. In our number 6 spot today we have lions, tigers, and ligers. Crossbreeding experiments between lions and tigers have resulted in the creation of hybrid offspring known as ligers and tigans. Ligers are the result of breeding a male lion with a female tiger, while tigons are the offspring of a male tiger and a female lion. However, while these hybrids have been successful in terms of producing viable offspring, they raise significant concerns and have been regarded as ethically problematic. The primary issue with lion-tiger hybrids is related to their health and welfare. Ligers, in particular, often suffer from various health problems. Their large size, resulting from the combination of their parent species, puts a strain on their bodies, leading to skeletal and organ abnormalities. Ligers also have a higher likelihood of experiencing reproductive issues and shorten lifespans compared to their parent species. Additionally, these crossbreeding experiments are typically carried out for entertainment or commercial purposes, aiming to produce exotic and visually striking animals for display. This has raised ethical concerns about the welfare of the animals involved, as such breeding practices often prioritize profit and human fascination over the well-being of the hybrids. Moreover, these hybrid experiments highlight the blurred boundaries between species and the potential negative consequences of manipulating nature for human curiosity and amusement. While ligers and tigons may attract attention due to their very unique appearances, the ethical implications and potential harm to the animals involved have led to widespread criticism of such crossbreeding practices. In our number 5 spot today we have the farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money for them and their families. This should be amazing and great, right? Well, considering why we're all here today, I think we know the answer to that. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great things, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, but also needed way more higher quality food or else they'd stop producing more milk. And they were also less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits as well. So it's kind of like this situation of yes, they are producing more milk, well, which will get us more money, but they also cost us more, and truthfully, most of the times the increased milk production did not outweigh the growing costs. In our number four spot today, we have the Wolfen. Wish I never had to say the word Wolfen, but unfortunately, they do exist. These guys are created when a female common bottlenose dolphin is bred with a male false killer whale. They are extremely rare and have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. The first recorded Wolfen was born at the Tokyo. Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Probably a prime example of why maybe they shouldn't really exist in the first place. The first that was born in the United States that actually miraculously survived was at a sea life park in Hawaii in May of 1985, and her name is Kike Malu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully, the third one is still living. The most recent update I could find seems to state that at this point, both mother and her daughter are still alive, but unfortunately, they remain in captivity. In our number three spot today, we have the beefalo. Okay. Beefalo sounds kind of cute and silly, and it also looks pretty normal, so what could be wrong with this one? Well, let's start at the beginning. A guy named Charles Buffalo Jones started breeding them in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state, and the numbers remained relatively low because of the limited hunting 
licenses. Well, when the beefalo found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and there aren't any natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's wild. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that is the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole, so they can obviously clear up a water source pretty quickly. Not to mention the fact that they do their business in the water and how their heavy weight compacts the soil. Basically, they have totally thrown the ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and the insects and plant life around have also been affected. In our number two spot today, we have the Pyrenean Ebex. The Pyrenean Ebex is an animal that went extinct around 2000 in a horrible turn of events. The last one was a female named Celia and she was killed in an awful falling tree incident. These animals were native to the Pyrenees mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. This is due to two things, being hunted as well as the spread of human disease. Flash forward to 2003, however, and scientists tried to bring them back to life. This is the first extinct creature that scientists ever tried to clone. That is absolutely crazy, and it actually worked for seven minutes only. DNA from Celia, the last living individual of the species, was taken and implanted into the womb of a domestic goat. From here, the clone was in fact born but due to lung complications, was unable to survive for longer than seven minutes. It was a short life, but a monumental one that definitely broke new ground in the scientific world. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the human pig experiment. Back in 2017, researchers at the Sulk Institute for Biological Studies achieved a significant milestone by producing the first ever human pig chimera, as reported in the journal Cell. The team used cells from an adult human to create stem cells, which were then injected into Earth early stage pig embryos. These embryos were implanted into female pigs and allowed to develop for several weeks. Approximately one in every 100,000 cells in the later stage pig embryos was derived from humans. In this human pig experiment, the researchers encountered trial and error in finding human stem cells that developed in alignment with the pig's embryo's timeline. The ultimate goal of such research is to potentially grow human organs within pigs for transplantation, addressing the shortage of donors. Donor organs. While the study raises possibilities for life saving organ transplants, critics argue that mixing human and animal elements crosses ethical boundaries. The National Institutes of Health in the United States has prohibited federal funding for human chimera research, although there have been indications of potential relaxation under careful monitoring. The research opens up opportunities and ethical questions, but fears of creating half human, half animal chimeras are not applicable to the study. The next challenge for the research researchers is to improve efficiency and guide the human cells to form specific organs within the pig hosts. Mm -hmm.